welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today, we're looking at a new ultra-wide gaming monitor from MSI, which they've named the, and this one, it did take a bit of practice, the Optics MEG381 CQR Plus. MSI, they just don't learn about product names, do they? This one is far too long, it's hard to remember, it's terrible. Let's just hope the monitor itself isn't terrible. For this review, because I don't want to say that long name over and over again, I'm going to refer to this display as the 381 to keep it simple. The 381 has had a pretty interesting timeline to market and that MSI actually announced this product way back in January of 2020 and somehow between now and then they've managed to make the name longer. Between the announcement and launch 20 months later, the specs haven't really changed that much. We're looking at a 38 inch 3840 by 1600 ultra wide panel at an approximate 21.9 aspect ratio. It's not quite 21.9, but it's close enough. It's got a 2300R curve and uses IPS technology from what is almost certainly LG display, similar to some of the previous 38 inch format ultra wides we've looked at before. What MSI has managed to improve in the last two years is the refresh rate, which now tops out at 175 hertz through an included overclocking feature in the OSD, up from the original 144 hertz. So that's not too bad, and the overclock is quite easy to activate. All of those specs aside, the most interesting thing about the 381 and why I'm reviewing it today is it gives us our first chance to explore the results of NVIDIA watering down their G-Sync Ultimate program. G-Sync Ultimate has always been about certifying the absolute best HDR displays on the market. And in the past, this has meant models with full array local dimming or OLED panels. You know, we've seen models like the Acer Predator X27, the ASUS PG32UQX and Acer Predator X35 all come through this program with varying but generally decent HDR results. However, this year, NVIDIA decided to lower the requirements to allow in monitors that I personally wouldn't class as providing a full or true HDR experience. NVIDIA silently updated their website to change references to best HDR 1000 nits into a more vague lifelike HDR, with an NVIDIA rep telling Tom's Hardware that the HDR experience only has to be best in class and that G-Sync Ultimate was never defined by nits alone. Despite what NVIDIA claims, it's pretty obvious that the requirements changed this year to allow in monitors that previously wouldn't have met the standard. The MSI 381 is one of those displays. This is not a true HDR monitor. At best, it's semi-HDR with 56 zone edge lit local dimming and rated brightness topping out at 600 nits. That's a far cry from the PG32UQX, the previous G-Sync Ultimate display we looked at, which has a 1152 zone FALD backlight and over 1400 nits of peak brightness. So today we'll see whether this supposedly G-Sync Ultimate monitor is actually capable of lifelike HDR. Oh, and before we go any further, this monitor it is super expensive with a local MSRP in Australia of 3000 AUD, putting it on par with the price tag of the Samsung Odyssey Neo G9. This isn't crazy for a 38 inch monitor, models like the LG 38GL 950G are also super expensive, but it's just something to be aware of. Design wise, the first thing that catches the eye is not the screen itself, but the second OLED screen in the bottom left corner of the display. MSI called this their HMI or Human Machine Interface, which is the most wanky name I've ever heard for basically just a settings dial. It's also just a straight up pointless gimmick. The main idea to the dial is controlling monitor settings, but it's much slower and harder to navigate than using the main directional toggle OSD control. It also laughably doesn't directly interface with the monitor. It actually requires you to run the MSI Center software on your PC, which then relays any setting changes back to the monitor itself. It's actually quite baffling that the second screen interface for controlling settings doesn't work without MSI's PC side software, as I know a lot of people would rather not run background utilities like this if they can avoid it. There is one possible use case for the HMI, and that's being able to show some PC stats on the second screen, like GPU and CPU utilization, clock speeds, temperatures, and that sort of thing. It still requires setup in the MSI Center, of course, but this might be useful. Negating this, though, is that the HMI screen can't be disabled, either in the OSD or the MSI Center, so it's always on and can be distracting if you don't plan on using it. Now, MSI says they're going to update their software so that you can turn it off, but for now, you can't. 
Other gimmicks MSI has included are the RGB LED lighting along the front, which is at best useless and at worst distracting. I don't see how this adds any value whatsoever. Above this is a webcam, which does function, so that's something, but its position below the screen gives it a somewhat awkward angle and the quality isn't great. On a more positive note, MSI includes a camera cradle, so you can attach a much higher quality camera directly to the display, and there's also a mouse bungee if you want it. Unfortunately, MSI's insistence that the monitor comes with all these features and gimmicks means the chin of the monitor is comically large, like it's, it's massive and doesn't look great in my opinion. This is coupled with some gamer-style stuff on the back, and it's fair to say I'm not really a fan of the design. With all that said, the 381 is reasonably well built and includes acceptable material quality like the metal stand legs, which I like. In fact, the whole legs assembly looks decent. It supports height and swivel adjustment, phaser mounting, and it's reasonably sturdy for such a large panel. As a reminder, this display is taller and about 10 centimeters wider than a standard 34 inch ultra wide that are most common in the market today, and it does so at a similar pixel density. Display inputs, we get two HDMI 2.0 and one DisplayPort 1.4. It's only the DisplayPort that supports up to the full 175Hz at the maximum resolution. The HDMI ports are limited to just 85Hz, so it's disappointing HDMI 2.1 hasn't been included here to resolve that bottleneck. Although our understanding is that NVIDIA's latest G-Sync modules don't support HDMI 2.1. Then we have the OSD, controllable through a directional toggle. There's a decent feature set in here, including things like crosshairs and information displays, along with the usual color controls. Next up, response time testing. And MSI have included just three overdrive settings, although as this is a G-Sync Ultimate monitor, it does include variable overdrive, which is a good thing. So we'll kick off the testing here by looking at the normal mode at 175 hertz. Nothing too amazing here. We're coming in a little better than a 10 millisecond average response time with no overshoot. So this looks like classic overdrive disabled behavior. One mode above this is the fast mode, the default mode for this monitor, and yeah, well, but this isn't amazing. Few things to break down here. Firstly, response times have improved substantially. We've gone to a 3.73 millisecond average response, which is excellent and more than fast enough for 175 hertz gaming. Unfortunately, this has pushed overshoot a bit too far. While a lot of this overshoot is concentrated to responses that are close together, more than half of all transitions do have noticeable overshoot beyond our 15% threshold. So this means inverse ghosting trails are noticeable while viewing fast action. However, cumulative deviation is no better with this mode compared to the previous mode. What this means is that effectively, the slow blur trails present in the normal mode have been replaced with inverse ghost trails in the fast mode at almost the same ratio. Ideally, there would be a mode between normal and fast that would be the best to use. Then we have the faster mode. Cumulative deviation is increased now, which is a bad thing as overshoot is up significantly compared to the prior mode. This mode is largely unusable in my opinion. The only real point to having this is so that MSI can advertise one millisecond response times. And yeah, the best transitions I measured were in that one millisecond range. As for gaming across the refresh range, it's an interesting one with the MSI 381. Between 175Hz and 120Hz, performance is basically unchanged at all these refreshes. We get response performance between 3.7 and 4.2 milliseconds using the fast mode, with an inverse ghosting rate in the mid 50s. But at 100Hz and below, overshoot becomes a lot less problematic, and at 85Hz, it looks like variable overdrive kicks in to reduce this overshoot amount. What this means is that the fast mode is actually pretty good for gaming in the 100Hz and lower range. Meanwhile, the normal mode is really no better for gaming at higher refresh rates, as what we talked about previously holds true here in that inverse ghost trails are simply replaced with blur trails. Cumulative deviation in the higher refresh range is no better using normal and only slightly improved at 144 and 120Hz. Below 100Hz, the monitor is clearly not as good as the fast mode, so I wouldn't recommend it for those refresh rates. This brings up the question of whether the 381 has a single overdrive mode experience. Based on this testing and the fact the normal mode really isn't that much better than the fast mode at high refresh rates, I think it does have a single overdrive mode experience with the fast mode, it's just that this mode isn't great and probably could have been tuned a bit better to reduce overshoot and inverse ghosting. It's not that noticeable, it's certainly not as noticeable as some other monitors with high inverse ghosting rates, as cumulative deviation was still decent, but it could have been better. 
In comparison to other monitors at their respective maximum refresh rates, the MSI381 is fast, much faster than most other ultrawides. Unfortunately, that comes at the expense of significant overshoot. Despite this overshoot, the 381 still can't match the Odyssey G9, which is also being driven right to the edge of acceptable performance, except in this instance, it can do so with speeds about one millisecond faster. You also see monitors like the 34 g 850 here, which is slower but less error prone, and naturally the 381 is miles ahead of VA panels in performance. On average, the MSI 381 has more manageable overshoot thanks to the help of variable overdrive, though the results still aren't amazing. The 381 is faster than the 34 g 850 but does so with higher overshoot, while Samsung's 49-inch VA Super Ultrawides absolutely dominate this metric with insane performance below 4 milliseconds. The 381 isn't bad, it's just more of a typical IPS experience. In cumulative deviation, we get to see how that balance of speed and overshoot plays out because it's not always clear how the monitor compares when you have some displays with lots of overshoot and others with little. The basics here is that the 381 is really no different to the 34G and 850 on average, which makes sense as both use the same generation of LG IPS panels. The 34G and 850 performs well for an ultrawide and is certainly fast, but I do feel that some performance is being left on the table thanks to limited overdrive settings. The best IPS monitors of today are capable of cumulative deviation in the mid-500 range, so it's a shame we don't get to see that here with variable overdrive in play. Dark level smearing is not an issue to worry about with the 381, but it does help illustrate the disparity between high-end ultrawides like this monitor and more budget-friendly 34-inch VA monitors like the bottom four in this chart. Those monitors have a lot of dark level smearing, which you don't get when you buy a high-end IPS. 120Hz performance shows us pretty similar results to what we've talked about. The 381 is fast but error prone at high refresh rates, so while it finishes high in the chart, it's not as good as some of the other monitors around it. Meanwhile, at 60Hz, we get much more reasonable results, and this is where I feel the 381 is most suited to gaming, below 100Hz using the fast mode. Input lag, a non-issue, and among ultra-wide panels, this monitor actually has quite good latency as you get the benefit of both a low processing delay, but also a relatively good refresh rate of 175Hz. This is just that marginal bit better than the 144Hz refreshes you get from a lot of other ultrawides. Power consumption is nothing to be concerned about with results in line with other displays considering the size and aspect ratio. Also, normally next we talk about backlight strobing, but this monitor doesn't support it, so let's move into color testing. The MSI 381 is a wide gamut monitor and in my testing recorded a neat 94% DCI-P3 coverage. That's a little shy of the 96% that MSI claims, but you know, it's still in a pretty similar ballpark. We don't get any additional gamut coverage here, so the 381 is not suitable as an Adobe RGB monitor, but coverage of P3 is pretty good. This leads to a total Rec 2020 coverage of 70%, which is basically identical to other monitors that use LG Nano IPS technology with its KSF phosphor backlight. Factory calibration has some good and bad elements. Adherence to the sRGB gamma curve is near perfect, but unfortunately, my unit came with a moderate blue slash cold tint, as you can see in the CCT chart. This led to mediocre results in grayscale delta E, but isn't what I've come to expect from G-Sync Ultimate displays, which are usually a bit better calibrated than this. But hey, it's the sample MSI sent out, so I expect it to be reflective of retail units. The good news, though, comes in the saturation chart. The MSI381 comes with an sRGB emulation mode listed as SDR Colors sRGB in the OSD menu, and that's enabled by default. This limits the wide gamut monitor to sRGB content correctly for viewing most standard content like web pages and YouTube videos, and it prevents oversaturation. This is the way wide gamut monitors should come configured, although in this case, the Delta E results aren't perfect due to the white point issue we talked about. In comparison to other monitors, the 381 isn't great for grayscale calibration, being more of a mid-table offering. However, in Color Checker, the fact the sRGB mode is enabled by default leads to excellent results that are competitive with the best displays on the market. To make matters even better, the sRGB mode has no limits on any other color settings. It's just a simple toggle between sRGB colors and wide gamut colors. This means we can use OSD controls to completely correct the white point, and I did so with my unit using these OSD settings. With this, I was able to achieve outstanding grayscale results, with a Delta E ITP below 1.5, amazing for a consumer monitor. This continues with really strong results for colors, to the point where a full calibration only produces a marginally superior results. This illustrates why monitors should ship with sRGB modes, but without any limitations on using those modes. 
I did end up performing a full calibration anyway using Calman Ultimate, but as you can see here, results are only slightly better and no different to the results just shown. At the end of the day though, the monitor can be quite suitable for sRGB and P3 work after a bit of calibration has occurred, whether that's in the OSD or via an ICC profile. SDR brightness is strong at nearly 500 nits after calibration. The brightness slider in the OSD is listed in nits, but I found this value was only loosely accurate and could exceed the maximum 450 nits shown in there. Minimum brightness was also good at below 50 nits, so there's quite a large range of usable brightness here to choose from. Native contrast on the other hand was poor. This is a lingering issue of LG's nano IPS technology. It's fast, it has good gamut coverage, but this comes at the expense of contrast ratio. My 381 sample was a little worse than the 34G and 850, but both monitors had contrast below 1000 to 1, which is going to limit black levels while gaming in a dark environment. VA panels are far superior in this metric, with some of the best providing four times greater contrast than the 381. Viewing angles are a non-issue with this display and most high-end IPS monitors of today. Uniformity was also above average in my case. There was a slight tone difference between the top left and bottom right of my unit, but overall, the panel is quite uniform despite its zoned backlight. This will also vary from unit to unit. The final section of this review is on HDR performance. Despite being G-Sync Ultimate certified, the MSI381 is only a semi-HDR monitor in my opinion. Its brightness is acceptable, meeting the minimum 600 nits peak that we like to see. It also has fine color performance with a wide gamut and 8-bit plus FRC processing. However, it's once again the contrast element that limits the HDR performance of the display and leads to only a semi-HDR rating under our system. The reason for this comes down to the edge-lit local dimming backlight. This backlight is superior to the usual edge-lit backlight in that there are more zones, 56 in this case, and it's split into a top and bottom row, which each contain 28 zones. Normally, edge-lit panels are only lit in full columns, but at least this MSI monitor can be lit differently between the top and bottom. However, this is still totally insufficient for a full HDR experience, as any bright elements lit in the middle of the screen will still need to illuminate both the top and bottom zones simultaneously. The very low zone count is also not sufficient for dimming any fine detail, and is especially insufficient on a monitor of this size, which leads to a lot of blooming and haloing when viewing HDR content in practice. This used to be the differentiating factor between G-Sync Ultimate monitors and other HDR monitors that largely relied on edge-lit dimming. G-Sync Ultimate would give you full array local dimming for a true HDR experience and anywhere from moderate to low levels of bloom, while other displays would have terrible edge-lit blooming. The MSI381 and its G-Sync Ultimate with edge-lit dimming is much closer to the terrible blooming end of the scale than it is to the FALD experience that used to be an effective requirement to be G-Sync Ultimate certified. So needless to say, I'm not happy with the watering down of the spec. Yes, it's slightly better than most other edge-lit panels, but not significantly so, and for that reason, I can no longer trust G-Sync Ultimate to be a brand that signifies true HDR and a good HDR gaming experience. Let's see why that's the case with some charts. Here is full screen sustained brightness. Now with the four previous G-Sync Ultimate monitors I tested, all were capable of at least 750 nits in this metric, if not 1000 nits like the PG32 UQX. The MSI381 is only capable of 530 nits in a full screen sustained white window, which is no better than other Display HDR600 monitors that aren't G-Sync Ultimate certified. In terms of full screen flash brightness, the 381 does improve to provide nearly 700 nits, but other G-Sync Ultimate monitors were previously capable of over 1000 nits, so the MSI model is noticeably worse than other true HDR panels. Then when we see sustained brightness with a 10% window, the MSI 381 starts falling down the chart and is now only mid-tier, beaten by the LG C1 OLED and other G-Sync Ultimate monitors. The PG32 UQX with its mini LED backlight can get well over 1000 nits brighter than this MSI model. For brightness versus window size, the 381 can hit nearly 700 nits peak in all circumstances, but this is still quite a low value by modern LCD HDR capable display standards, and sustained brightness for larger window sizes is even lower than this. These sorts of results contribute to a lackluster HDR presentation. In ideal situations, the MSI 381 is capable of decent contrast. These are usually in scenes where brightness changes substantially between one frame and the next, such as for bright flashes. At maximum, the 381 is capable of just over 100,000 to 1 contrast, as the backlight doesn't fully switch off when showing black. 
Some displays like the LG C1 and Odyssey Neo G9 are capable of infinite contrast as they do switch off the backlight completely. In best case, single frame contrast, which shows a bright and dark element on screen at the same time, but far apart, the limitations of MSI using edge lit dimming come to play. Despite having local dimming, the backlight just can't dim dark areas sufficiently, and that leads to a mediocre result of 28,000 to 1. This is below even the Acer Predator X27, which was the first generation of G-Sync Ultimate Monitor, and is a much smaller display with simply better local dimming. But what if you have a more dynamic HDR content scene where dark and bright areas might be close together or where lots of other things are happening on screen at the same time? This is where the difference between good FALD monitors and edge lit monitors are exposed. Prior G-Sync Ultimate displays were able to exceed their native contrast ratio in this test by some margin. The PG32UQX, for example, is five times superior than native, and while the panel does have some blooming, the experience is a lot better than the MSI381, which in this test is no better than some monitors that just can't do HDR properly at all and have no local dimming. The dimming zones just aren't small enough on the 381 for any meaningful HDR experience in most content. The majority of the time, all the backlight zones will be enabled and you'll see huge halos. Similar story in the checkerboard test where contrast is no better than native and therefore it's not really giving an HDR experience at all. You really need at least a mini LED backlight to produce strong results in this test and ideally combine that with a VA panel. On a positive note for the HDR experience, it's not bad in terms of accuracy with good tracking of the HDR10 EOTF curve, a nice roll off around the 700 nits maximum the display can do. It also has reasonable saturation accuracy, especially for P3 and Rec. 709 within HDR, so games won't look oversaturated in the HDR mode. It's more that the maximum HDR capabilities of this screen aren't where they need to be. So there you have it, the MSI Optics MEG381 CQR Plus, or as I've been calling it, just the MSI381. This isn't strictly speaking a bad monitor. It's a competent monitor that's good at most of the things a gaming monitor needs to be good at. It's fast, a bit too much overshoot, but motion performance is still good at a decent 175Hz refresh rate and similar to other LG Nano IPS ultra wide monitors. It's wide gamut, it has an excellent sRGB emulation mode which allows for great hardware calibration and accuracy, and it's a nice large ultra wide panel with a great resolution that's really nice to game on. Despite all of this, it's really hard to recommend the 381 for a number of reasons. The big one is the HDR performance. This is advertised as a G-Sync Ultimate monitor, which used to be the pinnacle of HDR gaming monitor certification, but this display is far from an ultimate HDR experience. 56 edge lit zones simply isn't enough to properly display HDR content, which is all about that high dynamic range as the name says. The first generation of 384 zone FALD panels was barely enough, so going back down to 56 zones, but still slapping a G-Sync Ultimate sticker on it is not good. This is at best a semi-HDR monitor, which means it does provide a somewhat better than SDR experience in its HDR mode, but we're still a long way off what HDR should look like as you do get from mini LED or OLED displays. This has bigger implications than the MSI381 being not that good for HDR, and the fact that it's G-Sync Ultimate certified isn't even really MSI's problem or fault. It also makes it hard just to have confidence in NVIDIA's G-Sync Ultimate program anymore. This used to be such a great brand that was a go-to stamp of approval telling you that the monitor in question was going to have excellent HDR. But if they're approving these sorts of monitors as G-Sync Ultimate, the sticker is virtually worthless and no better than some of the crappy display HDR certifications we've been complaining about for years. Simply put, the criteria for G-Sync Ultimate is all wrong if the 381 is passing through. On top of that, we have things that I don't really like to see on high-end products, overdrive settings that aren't tuned as well as they could be, a few issues with factory calibration, a poor native contrast ratio, and perhaps worst of all, pointless gimmicky inclusions like the second OLED display that hurt the design more than they improve it. In my opinion, MSI would have been far better off ditching the HMI display and spending all that engineering effort absolutely nailing the overdrive and color experience out of the box. This all culminates in a price tag that is ludicrously high. Now, I don't have US pricing just yet as the monitor isn't available there yet, but MSI told me this is a 3000 AU dollar monitor, which places it on par with the Samsung Odyssey Neo G9 locally, and not that much cheaper than the something like the ASUS PG32UQX, which is already a super expensive monitor. 
Now, the Neo G9's HDR is broken right now due to a firmware issue, but that aside, just the regular SDR experience on that monitor is a lot better from the Neo at the same price. It's bigger, it's faster, it has a higher refresh rate, and it has better contrast. Unfortunately, this sort of insane price tag isn't that unusual for these 38-inch 3840 by 1600 displays. Meanwhile, the LG 34G and 850, so a high-end 34-inch ultra-wide, that is a $1,500 monitor. So upgrading to 38 inches is at minimum costing you 45% more, if not double, which is not a great value proposition. Yeah, I personally prefer the larger format ultrawide. It's 25% larger, and that's a decent amount more real estate, but I'm not willing to pay over 50% more to get it unless it's also bringing in additional features. The only way I'd be able to recommend the MSI 381 is if it were a true HDR monitor with a mini LED backlight. The high-end price tag, yeah, it still would have been somewhat hard to swallow given the state of OLED TVs, but at least you'd be buying a truly high-end experience. But as it stands, it's too expensive and it needs a price cut to be worth considering up against other more SDR or semi-HDR uh, ultra-wide monitors. Anyway, that's it for this review of the MSI 381. A few things for MSI to work on here, a bit more focus on the performance of the monitor, less focus on gimmicks would be nice, and then yeah, just hopefully a future version of this panel will enable MSI to offer a true HDR experience and proper G-Sync Ultimate certification. Uh, anyway, if you're interested in supporting our monitor testing, we do have all the usual things for supporting us. You can just, well, subscribe to the channel, give the video a like, those things always help. But also, we have our Patreon and Floatplane accounts if you want to support us directly, help support our monitor testing. We've been investing lots into monitor testing recently, so yeah, all those things add up, and we do appreciate the support of our community. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.